Hi guys! I'm Sidra Kaluska and this is An Artist's Life and welcome to my garden. Sorry for the prolonged lapse in videos. I've been very busy gardening and trying to get some art done but I thought you guys would like to see what I have going on in my garden right now. It's been warm. We have finally been getting some rain and things are starting to kind of explode so I thought I'd show everyone what is happening in there so stay tuned thought i would start off in the perimeter i definitely do need to get in here and do some weeding but the clumps of grassy looking stuff in the middle that is some garlic chives they will be blooming late this summer early fall they're really great for pollinators and over here, this beautiful big bushy thing is anise hyssop. The pollinators absolutely love this plant. Um, I don't think the bees have quite discovered that it is in bloom yet. I've seen a couple bees in here, but later after some of my flowers start to go to sleep um, they're going to find this plant super attractive so I'm going to probably try to plant more of these at some point. Okay this tall gangly looking fellow right here um, have some fennel going on. It was supposed to be bronze fennel and bronze fennel has this lovely bronzy color right there um, but apparently the seeds that I ordered online were crossed with a standard fennel because this lovely green color is a standard fennel and it has gotten absolutely large and bushy um, this is the second year they are perennials it is going into bloom so hopefully I can gather my own fennel seeds this year which would be lovely because I love them for cooking I don't know if you'll be able to pick it up on my video, but there is a lot of bee buzzing in the background. Do you finally have a lot of bee pollinators in the garden, which I'm super excited about? Bee population seems to have been kind of straggling this year in particular. We did have some late cold spells and some really early hot spells, which I'm afraid did affect their general population. So I have over here, since I don't have a massive garden, I am putting some plants in grow bags. I've been relatively happy with the grow bags, but I have noticed that you do need to keep them watered more than your standard plastic pot, but they are supposed to uh, create a better root structure. So if you tend to overwater your plants or live in a very rainy area, it might be a good idea. If you're in a very dry, hot area, you may want to go with something with better moisture retention. I have installed bamboo posts in here, and that's to help support the plant as they grow. I do have one interesting new plant that I have never grown before. It is a very prickly gal right here. Let's zoom in on that. So this is a lychee tomato. Let's see. Get in there. Yes, so we have these lovely super sharp thorns. And yes, this is very, very, very thorny. Um, the thorns were kind of even going through my heavy duty gardening gloves. So I was trying to get it into a situation that I can just kind of prop it up as it grows so I don't have to handle it a whole bunch. It's not technically a tomato, but it's still in the same nightshade family and we can kind of tell that based on the weaves and the flowers for sure. It kind of reminds me of my eggplant, which I have right over here. So, some kind of similar leaf structure, not prickly, but the flowers are also very similar too. I 
installed this brick walkway earlier this year. Looks like I need to do a little maintenance work, but I'm quite happy with that. I do want to do a kind of mirror of it on the inside track. Have some more peppers over here. And in the back corner, I actually have a purple tomatillo plant. If you're wondering what this crazy bushy madness is, I have three different kinds of potatoes planted in here. They do spread out a whole bunch and kind of can take over a bed really quickly. Um, so I have installed some bamboo posts to help support the plants to keep it a little better contained so I can plant crops next to it and not have them completely enveloped. I was doing some reading recently and it was suggesting that by propping up your potato vines it actually prolongs its growing season and if you prolong its growing season you will also increase your actual potato yields. So we'll see how this works. In front of these potato plants, I have some red acre cabbage. It's the first time I've grown it this year. One problematic thing if you ever grow cabbages are your cabbage moths. They put out these little green caterpillars, which does make it easy for me to find on these plants because they're bright green and stand out really well. can see these poor plants have gotten eaten quite a bit. I'm not really a fan of using any pesticides, and if I do, I shoot for organic. Um, I have used one with neem oil in the past, and it actually burned my plants, and my plants died from the pesticide more than the insect damage. I recently ordered some that's BT. That's the abbreviation for it. It is actually a bacteria and is an organic form of pest control. You can spray that on your cabbages or other greens that might get um, moth infections and it will cause the caterpillars when they ingest it to stop feeding. So it will kill specifically um, caterpillar life and it's safe for bees and um, in the pollinator state like butterflies once they're in the adult state as long as it's not ingested. So I'm going with this route. We'll see how it works. I've never used it before. Um, the major reason I bought it was for cabbage boars. I'm sorry, for squash boars see my squash plants getting really big and lovely back here. We kind of have an explosion of growth going on. I did plant some of these daisies in here and they have taken off maybe a little too well at times. So I've been having to hoist my squash plant out of the garden to ensure that there's more space in the actual raised bed for the plants that I wanted to grow in here, such as my tomatoes. They need their space. But with the issue with the cabbage, I mean the squash boars, um, I can tell that it's already started to get some in the vine and what they do is they actually eat the vine from the inside. So and after they hatch, tiny little caterpillar larva drill their way into the plant. So down here in the stem, it looks like I'm starting to get a little bit of damage in there, but in general my plants are still really big and happy. So by injecting some of this um, thinned out pesticide, I can kill the larva inside the plants. I'll try this maybe another week and do a second dose in another week and then at that point I'll try putting 
some dirt back around the base and it can help the plant re-root. If you can kill the boar on the inside, either by um, some sort of chemical means or by stabbing or otherwise removing them, you can ensure the plant will live. We do have these semi-massive tomatoes growing. In previous years, I had trimmed back a lot of my leaves and I had trimmed off my suckers. The tomato book that I'm reading currently was recommending to actually leave everything because by removing the leaves, you're reducing the plant's ability to pho photosynthesize. And if you're reducing its ability to photosynthesize, you're actually reducing the quality flavor of your tomato themselves. So I'm trying it this year to see how that goes. I'm also not really trimming off many of the suckers. If they get a little too crazy at the base, I was taking some of those off. But as you can see, my plants have become absolutely massive and bushy. The metal cages are a good six feet tall, I would say. I have Italian paste, a peach, white cherry, black cherry, zebra, um, no not a zebra, a bumblebee sunrise which is a striped, and a tiger tom which is also striped but um, a little bit bigger than the bumblebee sunrise. So in the back I have a sunflower and more squash. And I was trying to come up with an idea of getting more plants in my limited area. I have sweet potatoes in here. So these are some sweet potato vines. If you've never grown sweet potato before, they can really take over the garden. You can see I have some extensive vine work coming out here already. So I'm just gonna have to stay on top of controlling where they're going and kind of mitigating how much they're taking over. But since they spread so extensively, I was worried about planting, say, my peppers in here because they could easily take over my pepper plants. So my solution this year was to half bury these five gallon, they're three or five gallon pots that I have my pepper plants in. This gives them about six inches of space above ground level, which helps, you know, lift them from the surface so they don't get smothered by the lower rising plants. Your sweet potatoes will vine out and they can kind of climb to cascade over things, but they don't actually vine climb like say your morning glories would. So just giving them that extra space will enable them to um, not get smothered by other things. I also have some Christmas lima beans growing up on the fence. I have purple yard long beans and I also have green yard log beans. They reach their peak at different times so I was trying to have a diverse range so I would have different varieties maturing at different times. I also have a Asian cucumber. I think it's to show you long. It's prickly. It's a very interesting, interesting long skinny cucumber. I have become a fan. It is blight um, powder mildew resistant, which is a major issue in our humid area. This is called Orich. It is magenta magic. It has these beautiful purple magenta leaves. There are several different varieties and colors. It is heat tolerant, although it does prefer a cool, wet environment. The main reason I was looking at getting these was because it was listed as um, enduring more heat than a lot of other crops even though it does prefer cooler weather. But I also just love the color. It's pretty tasty for salads and the like. Okay. 
So back here, I do have a walkway here, I assure you. Um, it is kind of getting completely taken over by my cascading squash plant at this point. I am growing delicata this year. I am quite happy with the flavor of the delicata. It's kind of a dry, sweet roasting squash. It works wonderfully baked. I've not tried making soup, but I think it would work well for that too. It has an almost flaky pastry-like texture to it. It's not really wet like sometimes your pumpkins and um, butternut squash can be particularly on the soggy side. This stays kind of drier. I like the flavor better. And for those of you potentially growing squash for the first time, I spotted a little problem in here. Right there, underside in there, those are squash beetle eggs. So I definitely want to come and smash those. They do take a lot of life out of the plant and can do a fair amount of damage when you start having them in mass quantities. So I'm definitely going to take care of that before I go too far so I remember. In general, everything seems to be growing super well. I tried to do my best to keep a really healthy soil body. I put all of my compost in my garden over the fall and bury that down so it continued breaking down and providing nutrients for the plants. I've also mulched the garden very heavily and I have used um, goat manure hay and leaf mulch. I've also been getting the coffee grounds from Starbucks for the past couple months and I've been sprinkling those around in here. They're really full of nitrogen and other nutrients and caffeine can actually help control your slug population because caffeine is toxic to slugs. So this is the vegetable garden. I of course don't stop with just vegetables. My yard is kind of swarming with honeybees right now which makes me really happy. I have an old pan that I've set up as a bird bath but it's actually really important to have some bodies of water for your pollinators too because they need water as well. I do keep a rock or a couple rocks in all of my bird baths because if your bees do fall in and they can't get out you can actually drown them but if you have something that they can crawl onto and dry off on then they can fly away from that point. So it's just a little safety measure for your pollinators. So my lavender is blooming right now. I started these from seed. Have a couple kinds of succulent ground covers going on. And that's a kind of sedum. Had a sedum over here as well that bloomed earlier this year. Now these are particularly fun. This is an ice plant which works for zone 6B. I think it does go down to maybe a 5. I can't 100% remember. But it does have some lovely flowers that the bees seem to appreciate as well. And I love my blazing stars. These are blazing stars. I started off with a couple bulbs at one point. It was an overgrown clump that I thinned out and over time just propagated a whole bunch. They grow new plants through root division or bulb division. And right now, this is just one small section. Have irises in there that have already bloomed. More blazing stars. I do need to work on 
getting some more flower stuff started over here but I've been working on cleaning this up a little bit did add a fringe tree earlier this year which I was really excited about over here this is what makes me pretty darn happy have a whole bunch of blazing torches lining my mailbox garden which is just a hum with happy little bees This thick bed in here is a creeping oregano, which will bloom later this summer, which a lot of the small native bees really appreciate as well. Over here, this odd little bushy plant that looks a little spindly right now is still getting started. This is a winter jasmine. It is not native, sadly. However, it will bloom in February and January. It does bloom on the older wood, so it would have to be a season old before it would start blooming. But I'm trying to propagate some of that in here, so I'll have some blooms during the early season if we have warm spells and the bees wake up. This is a golden lemon balm with some larope in the front. I've started putting some ice plant sprigs in here to spread out and I also have some sections of garlic chives to hopefully bloom later this season as well. And for a bit of a wow factor, this is what my front staircase is looking like right now. This is a type of native daisy. I can't remember the specific name. I'll look it up and include it in the blog down below. I started a couple of these plants three years ago, and from there they've reseeded or just come back on their own. So I've interplanted them with the blazing stars to get that beautiful yellow and purple combination. It is just humming up here like crazy. This plant here and its counterpart over here is a double rose of Sharon, so it has two tiers of petals. It does have a very rose-like appearance to them. I was given those by a friend and these larger bushes back here, those are Nanking cherries. They are a bush opposed to a tree. If you trim them back regularly, they bush out more and create a thicker foliage cover. If you just let them go, they get kind of tall and spindly. So I've been making a point of making sure that I trim them back to create a nice bushy atmosphere. We will have a nice explosion of cherry blossoms this coming, or I should say next spring. And we had a fair amount of cherries this year, so I suspect we will be getting a lot of cherries next year. To kind of even things out a little bit, I wanted to mirror my mailbox garden to a certain extent down here to give it a little bit more balance. So, have put in a couple of iris plants that I just divided from the iris plants I have up there and added in more of the blazing stars to give it a border. Have some goosenecks here. We'll see if they bloom because the deer keep trimming them back. Have um, 
some purple asters that I transplanted in here. They won't bloom till this fall. It's one of the last plants that blooms in the fall, which is really important to have some plants for your fall pollinators because food does become more scarce. That was from a plant that planted itself at one of my former homes and I just propagated it. So now I have a lot of those as well. And also had a white aster plant itself in here. It does look kind of spindly. Um, deer absolutely love eating asters, so I do need to put a little bit of protection around them at time. Some sticks are really helpful, just poking sticks in around the plant so it pokes out around three to four inches from where your plant will grow to because it will start to poke the deer in the face when they try to eat it and they don't really like getting poked in the face. So it works really well to deter them from eating things you don't want them to. So here we go up the staircase. I don't know if you can hear the beads, but it's absolutely humming through here. And I don't want to get too close, but this cherry bush in the middle, I have had a cardinal set up a nest right in the back. I'm not sure if you can make it out or not. I have some wire cages in here to help protect the core of the bush from the deer. And the cardinal has built the nest on top of the cage, but underneath the foliage. One thing I like about having a variety of flowers, it provides a variety of food for different pollinators. So these tiny little bees really like the daisies. I haven't noticed your standard full-size bees going after the daisies as much, whereas the larger flowers are attracting my larger bees. So by having a variety that does ensure that you have a larger, diverse pollinator population coming to your house. These are also the double rows, Sharon. So they have two tiers. the hydrangea which I haven't seen bloom in years because of the deer but we might eventually move it at one point but just leaving it there for now these are loving the torches here as well I do have some blue rug ground cover junipers in here that I do need to weed around we're trying to get those to help take over the hill but in the meantime, they're definitely going to need help. Our yard is absolutely filled with clover. I'm hoping this fall that I can get a ton of horse manure delivered to my house and just put down about four to six inches on the entire hill to kill off all the grass so I can just come in next spring and plant a lot of wildflowers. Might try to turn this into a big daisy explosion. This is an interesting bush that I'm hoping does a little bit better. It's a Pennsylvania bayberry, which is also, I think, native to Virginia as well. I see that I'm starting to get Japanese beetles. I guess it's that time of year. It does have a soft scent to it. There are male and female plants. So in order to get any kind of fruit, you do need to have both. 
and the female produces the berries which you can boil and extrude a waxy substance that's used for um, can be used for cosmetics it can be used for candles it has a very pleasant smell you've probably seen candles in the store usually around your fall or Christmas season the leaves have a wonderful scent as well and can even be used as a bay leaf substitute so my plants weren't super happy last year so I didn't collect any leaves but this year I'm hoping to collect some leaves because I do like to use a fair amount of bay leaves for my cooking. Okay, These trees are finally starting to grow. So happy that they are growing. They've probably grown around two feet this year. Previous years they were really struggling. First year I didn't have a cage around them and the deer were absolutely destroying them. They almost didn't make it through the year. Um, but they seem to be pretty happy now they have protection. This is a native plum. Um, they're considered a dwarf variety. They only get about 10 to 12 feet tall and have a bushing habit. So it will put out a lot of lower branches um, and at a certain point when they do become more mature they actually can create suckers which are root offshoots that can create more plants so if you see one of these native plums in the wild there could also be a 10 foot radius or possibly even more around it of the same tree like genetically the same tree because it's actually just putting up separate branches elsewhere. In order to get fruit from them, you do have to have it cross-pollinate. So when I ordered it, they actually shipped two. And luckily, both of them are still alive. So we're going to keep our fingers crossed that this spring, this coming spring next year, will be the, the magic one where well, they will flower. They produce smaller fruit. Um, it can be orange to red. Here I have a clump of brandy wine, raspberries. They are also a little sad too because the deer seems to like them. And some thornless blackberries over here that the deer also have been kind of stripping. So. My goal is to be able to put a fence around this area at one point, um, but that's definitely going to be a little bit down the line. Supplies have definitely gotten more expensive during COVID, so um, I'm probably going to have to put that off for a little while. you're trying to do some sanctuary type places it's good to have a patch of wildness going on because it creates a habitat for birds and potentially small animals to live although I'm not particularly fond of trying to create an environment for rabbits or groundhogs because they want to eat my food and I want to eat it too do have to be careful because I know there's poison ivy in here, but we have a lot of wild blackberries that are fruiting this year. So it's going to be a while for those to get ready. Um, let's see, over here, this spine over here, I can't really get in here and weed them out, but if you do see a vine like this and they love to climb things and that's what their leaves look like this is called bittersweet i think it might originate from japan i'm not a hundred percent sure it did come over from asia and was used for ornamental gardening for a long time they do produce these lovely clusters of bright orange kind of flower berry things um, that are beautiful for fall arrangements. However, they are extremely invasive and because of their climbing nature, they actually will kill trees and other plants. So I 
if you have any in your yard, I do recommend, if you can, to go in and remove them. Here is another cluster of them. They're actually kind of strangling themselves right here. So again, this is bittersweet. And if you're trying to do some environmental gardening, I highly recommend removing any bittersweet you find. Actually here, here are some of the berries right now. They're green in the early stages. Let's see. I do have another wild berry in here right over here. These lovely fruit, those are wild black raspberries, but I think it comes from a domesticated strand because there aren't a lot of thorns on the plant. You can see this is the same plant here. This one in the front, like there are a couple of thorns, but it's not nearly as thorny as a standard wild variety. And the fruit does seem to be a little bigger. So I'm hoping after I get that fence put in around the berry bushes and the um, the wild the native plums that I can start propagating these in that area as well. But I also have a ton of poison ivy in there, so I'm trying to stay clear of too much stuff. I do have a third berry type in here do have some these are wine berries they're very oddly prickly on the outside super thorny but this is actually uh, basically a domesticated strain that's gone wild over a lot of the country they're tasty they're very delicate the skin is very thin You'll probably never see these at market as far as a fresh fruit goes because they're so soft and tender that they just don't transport. So if you want this kind of fruit, you have to grow it or find somebody who has it so you can get it that day. Okay, my wheat that I planted last fall, probably October, November, looks like it's ready to harvest. I'll probably try harvesting that later this afternoon. This is my white winter wheat. It apparently is a short variety. I have some corn in the back and I added a couple blazing stars in front. I do have some starts of some pussy willow in here. I have those in containers right now, but I think I've made the decision that I wanna plant them in the front of this long garden because they do require a fair amount of moisture. And by putting them in my garden, since they'll be with my vegetables, I can ensure that I will be watering it because generally speaking, I don't wanna be watering my landscaping plants. But one reason that I do want the pussy willow is that they're one of the earliest things to bloom in the spring. And so again, I wanna ensure that I'm having some, having basically a variety of fruit um, for my pollinators when the season does start to get in gear. And this is my red winter wheat. We've had a couple storms come through and this is a very tall variety. It's three to four feet tall, but since it's so lanky, having the storms come through, it's just completely blown it down. So I might need to try to prop this up a little bit to help protect it as it's drying before I can harvest it. This is several weeks behind the white winter wheat, I believe. So I'll be putting in my fall garden in this area. I'll be leaving the wheat in place. I'll basically just be trimming the wheat stalks back as best I can, but leaving the plant in place and then just plant directly in there in the fall. Since it is a northern facing hill, it helps protect the ground from some of the earlier season frost. So I have a more prolonged growing period in this back area 
than I do with my raised bed, even though my raised bed gets more sunlight over the day. Okay, so that's basically that. I do have one more vine in here that I will show. This is a cinnamon vine, also a wild Chinese yam. They were used for ornamental gardening purposes and have basically naturalized, but they are not considered to be invasive unlike the bittersweet is. So I actually harvested some of these from our local park and planted the seeds. Um, it is kind of related to the morning glory or potato family. So um, it looks like it's actually trying to bloom right in there. And um, the seed pods basically look like this tiny little potato. So I planted a couple of those in there and it's really taken off this year. Okay, so that's that. That's my garden. Hope you're doing well. Hope you're staying cool and take care. Bye.